everyone, welcome friends to this Republic at 75 roundtable special. As India enters the 75th year of the Republic, there are two competing visions that are emerging. There's the Nehruvian vision, shaped by the first Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru in his Twist to Destiny speech. In essence, it saw India as a plural, secular republic emerging from the womb of colonialism. There is also now the vision, though, of Prime Minister Narendra Modi that questions the Nehruvian idea of India and offers what Mr. Modi's supporters call now a Bharatiya vision rooted in political and cultural nationalism. How will this tussle be resolved? On the Republic Day Roundtable Special, I'm joined by special guests, many of them historians, Professor Shruti Kapila is author, Intellectual History for India. She's Professor of History and Politics at the University of Cambridge. Professor Makhan Lal is historian and author. Professor Aditya Mukherjee, former professor, contemporary history and former director at the Jawaharlal Nehru Institute of Advanced Studies at JNU. And also joining me is Rajat Sethi, analyst and author. Uh, we hope to also be joined by Professor Shugato Bose at some stage but i want to raise all the big questions on this republic day weekend looking at first nehru versus modi whose vision appears more relevant to a new india why don't you start professor kapila give us your sense we've got two visions that are being offered to the people of india do you believe there's a conflict and which is more relevant uh, indeed, there is a conflict, there is a contestation, and I think that contestation is now, you know, up, out in the open. It is also one uh, which is democratic, uh, at least so far it remains democratic, uh, a democratic contest. I want to say that actually for all the lampooning of uh, Nehru, and of course I don't belong to the generation that grew up with Nehru, but was as it were a legacy much more of Indira Gandhi's reign. I come from that generation and the Ram Temple movement is when I came of age, as it were, with the second democratic uh, uh, upsurge. I do think that the Nehruvian uh, legacy is deep in India, whether it is its institu institutional architecture, a constitution which really made the individual the rights bearing citizen. So our, our constitution was very brave. It was very, uh, you know, progressive, but also one which wanted to develop India. It was a forward looking constitution, unlike many other constitutions in the world, which only want to protect, as it were, the status quo. So I think in lots of ways, Nehru's legacy stands uh, strong, both in terms of, as I said, educational, institutional, political, and bureaucratic architecture. What has changed undeniably is the cultural uh, sphere, the political sphere, in which a Hindu first uh, political agenda now wants to become the official, as it were, constitutional even, design of the country. And I think that is really the contestation. In terms of party politics, mm -hmm. that is clear to see that the BJP today is a hegemonic power, increasingly, you know, you know, expanding its footprint, much the way the Congress party was, as it were, the hegemonic political power for the first 70 or 80 years of the last century. Let me bring in Rajat Sethi for a moment, just to, uh, in a way, take that dialogue or the contestation forward, because you've got Professor Kapila saying that Nehru's was a constitutional republic. It was the architecture of it was framed by the constitution of 1950 that guaranteed equal citizenship. She seems to suggest that you are now moving at least de facto, if not de jure, to a, a, a society, a republic, where it is a Hindu first society and a republic. Your response. Well, Rajdeep, uh, I see more... Uh more than a contestation, I see an evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen uh, Prime Minister Nehru working hard to, you know, to to ensure that the scars of partition are uh, are healed, and he, you know, took certain decisions and steps in that direction, uh, largely uh, to to heal a wounded nation. Uh, but uh, that's far behind us. Uh, we are now racing towards uh, a society which is deeply proud of of its cultural heritage. Uh, it has shed its uh, colonial burden completely. Uh, it has come out of that mold much more confident. Today, we can look eye to eye uh, before the world and can proclaim that, yes, we are not just uh, a nation state which was born in 1947, but we are a rich and a thriving 
a civilizational nation which has withstood uh, the test of time for more than five uh, millennia. And that's what uh, every young Indian is proud of. And I think uh, it is this, this confidence which mm -hmm. took time. It took us uh, six, seven decades uh, to actually, uh, uh, you know, for generation, so several generations had to work towards this. But this current generation, the Gen Z and the Gen Alpha, is, is deeply proud of what we stand for. So I think uh, we shouldn't pit one ideology against the other, but mm -hmm. we should see it more of an evolutionary journey. And I believe that uh, the India of the future would ensure that uh, its uh, its secular credentials are remain uh, are kept I'll, intact. I'll, I'll come kept to intact, the. I'll, but I'll we are not. To, but uh, we are not. Yes. We are not a deracinated society. We, are, you we know, cannot be that. Okay, you're you're calling this an evolution, a new confidence that has come to India, Professor Mukaji. You want to respond to what you just heard uh, that. Uh, According to Rajat Sethi, this is an evolution. Don't contest Nehru versus Modi. The Nehruvian legacy was in a way shadowed by uh, what had happened during the colonial struggle for freedom. And now you've got uh, uh, the Modi legacy, which is a 21st century India aspiring to be uh, one of the largest economies in the world. And, and a new self-confidence, he claims, has crept into India. I don't see, Rajdeep, this as an evolution. I see it as a complete uh, inversion. It, was, it is not Nehru versus Modi. It is our national liberation struggle, our Indian national movement, the idea of India they had versus Modi. You know, from Dadabhai Naroji to Gandhi to Nehru to Bose to Bhagat Singh, none of them, none of them uh, thought of India as a Hindu Rashtra. Hmm? The, the, the distillate of our national liberation struggle is the constitution. What you are seeing now is the constitution versus Modi. Modi is now saying Desh, uh, his, his speech at the temple was Dev is Desh, Ram is Rashtra. <laughs> and the cabinet has just yesterday passed a resolution where, where it came in the papers today, where they are saying that uh, the, the body became independent in 1947, but the soul has now become independent only in 2022. You see, this sounds a bit like Kangana Rao, you know, India getting independence in, 19, in 2014. Now that date has been pushed further. But this is absurd. You know, this complete inversion where now we are talking of a Hindu Rashtra, the 500 years of struggle, which 500 years of struggle against whom? 1,000 years of struggle against Muslims. You know, it has got nothing. To, 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 to do with the inclusive, multicultural, uh, humane nationalism that we had. Now what we have is, you know, uh, a, a, a masculine nationalism where you know, the, the very slogan, Jai Shri Ram, puts terror in the minds of the people. I'm, I just want to tell you mm -hmm. that the Bhayanda riots, that Mira Bhayanda riots that occurred just the day before, in the, and uh, after that there were these bulldozers uh, on, on Muslim uh, houses and uh, of, uh, shops, etc., run through the place. And what does the BJP leader they say uh, over there? He says, this is uh, Nitesh Rane, he says, uh, I'm translating, uh, basically that because of what happened yesterday, which is what happened was that some people in a motorcycle, some shouting uh, Jai Shri Ram, etc., went through the Muslim locality, the usual provocative stuff, and there was a scuffle, there was a bit of a riot. Hmm? He says, Yad rakhna kal ke baad, hmm? chun chun ke maarenge Jai Shri Ram. You see, this chun chun ke maarenge Jai Shri Ram is not the Ram with, with, with whose name Gandhiji died. It is not the, the, the vision of uh, either Hinduism or, hmm. or of the Indian national movement. And certainly, Gandhiji and the Indian national movement was absolutely clear that the future India is not going to be a Hindu Raj, that it is not so religion you, and politics you, you believe, are not going to be mixed. Gandhiji says it repeatedly. Okay, so you believe it's not an evolution, it's actually a distortion of what was the original idea or a complete repudiation. Let me not even call it a dist distortion, a repudiation of what complete. was the original idea of complete. the Indian complete. Republic as a multi-faith plural republic. Professor Makhanlal, you want to respond? Is Professor Aditya Mukherjee, as some critics of his might allege, resorting to fear-mongering or sending out a warning that you cannot allow uh, India 75 years later to become from a multi-faith republic 
to a Hindu first majoritarian state. Right, Rajdeep Ji, thank you very much for calling me in the program. As far as vision is concerned, let us accept one point very simple. Change is the only law in the nature, whether it is vision, whether it is technology, whether it is society, whatever it may be. You may have had a vision of journalism, of the TV journalism 25, 30 years back. Can that vision be still valid with the change in technology, with the change in system and all that? <clears throat> After all, Churchill had a vision of the world and that is why in most difficult time he was chosen, elected to be the Prime Minister of the country. But immediately after the Second World War, he was defeated by the very same country within a year. Stalin was there, he had a vision, Mao had a vision, but they had all undergone. I will not call it repudiation, I will not call it inversion or overthrowing the thing. Sethiji used beautiful word, he, he used it, I was going to use it, but he used it first, so I am referring him, it's all evolution. There is no society in the world which does not evolve economically, socially, technologically, academically. Is the journalism same that was there in Nehru's time? As far as Aditya ji's concern about Hindu Rashtra, I must address that. It was never a Hindu Rashtra since India, Bharat came into existence. Its entire principle was not guided by any other principle except Vasudhaiv Kutumbakam has always been there from Rig Vedic time. That's Hindu concept of people's participation. Sarva Dharma Sambhav. All religions are same and respect is there for everybody. It doesn't talk about Hindu more respect and Muslim less respect or anybody. And third is Ekam Sat Vipra Vadanti. All these three are from the oldest book that belongs to Hindus. I am proud Hindu that these three concepts come from us and never we talked of Hindu Raj, never we talked of a Hindu king, never we talked of a Hindu law. And therefore this kind of, you know, no, but there is a reference, making you know, people afraid of it. No, I, 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 I you are saying that this is fear mongering. Yes. There will be those who will say that, you know, concepts like Vasudeva Kutumbakam are indeed uh, a proud uh, Bharatiya legacy. But what is the reality on the ground? Is the reality on the ground matching what you are saying? Is the question. When you have a parliament, for example, where the majority there... party does not have a single Muslim MP, or where there seems to be a sense that... No, you, uh, Rajdeep Ji, stop it. It's just a minute. Mm. Why don't you appeal Muslims to join BJP and RSS and change it from within. BJP doesn't appoint a Muslim parliamentarian. Parliamentarians have to be get elected joining parties. Don't you see this point? BJP doesn't have the Muslim parliamentarian. Mm -hmm. Is BJP responsible? Okay, can I Let get a fight after all? Can I get Aditya Sadhu Mukherjee? Can I get Aditya Mukherjee to people go Can I get just Aditya Mukherjee to quickly respond to you, which is basically what you are saying is do not do not spread fear. Yeah. Do not spread fear. Professor Mukherjee, you want to quickly respond to what Professor uh, 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 Makhanlal has just said? Yes, yes. It, uh, th there, is, there is cause for serious concern. We are, we are evolving certainly from a democracy into a theocratic or even a communal fascist state. So there is, there is great... I uh, don't agree. Uh, not a single fear. state government there, there has been dismissed. A Not king, a single a, state government has is, been dismissed in last 10 years, there is a, whereas more than 150 let, times, 356 let, provision has been used by Adit Mukherjee. One aspect of government. fascism is not let, to why, allow why others to speak. Why can't we talk in terms of okay. a oh, uh, Allow okay, others one to by, speak. One by one, but... Are we in a democracy? No, no, one minute. One, one minute. Are we in a democracy? No, no, yeah, one minute. Uh, if you are making words like we are moving towards a theocratic fascist state, I want an example, Professor Mukherjee. Let's not make a generalized attack. Let's give a specific example why you believe yes, that's happening. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. The new parliament <laughs> inaugurated with a Sengal, you know, with priests coming in as if a Maharaja is being brought in. 
the 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 whole if you watched the whole consecration ceremony in the ram mandir as if a, a king is being anointed you know with all priests all around etc and as i said you know i mean if you heard the speech mm -hmm. of, of the priest just before the prime minister modi spoke i mean he is saying that once in a lifetime you know once in many many yugs mm -hmm. does a man like narendra modi emerge almost suggesting an avatar has come and he's going to you know lead the country on you see that there is what is the language that that everybody is speaking the a what is what is the prime minister saying that after 500 years of struggle we won we have uh, we we have built this temple that is struggle against whom and which 500 years of struggle you know there was there was no struggle for the ram janmabhoomi bhoomi till the british in the 19th century said that there is that there is a local belief that there was a ram janmabhoomi under the mosque before that it was not even said neither the rss nor savarkar nor golwalkar nor, nor hindu mahasabha ever raised this question the whole issue comes up in 1986 87 you know and you are talking of 500 years see it is targeting it is targeting of the muslims and it has already started as i said riots have started okay and you you the, mentioned the mira bhayandar uh, you mentioned bia mira bhayandar which is extremely everything from ram okay let, let, everything from ram. let professor makhanlal respond and then i'll come to shruti but professor makhanlal respond the fact is that the entire ceremonies whether in just, parliament just or one, or at ram mandir according to professor mukherjee lead to the impression that prime minister is being coronated as a hindu king a hindu hriday samrat as his own supporters call him i am answering professor mukherjee's symbolism later let me first correct his knowledge of history he says that ram janmabhoom is issued during british period and before 1987 88 that is when jnu published its pamphlet it was not the case let me correct his historical knowledge akbar built the chabutra within the babri masjid allowed the puja to hindus because petition was made to akbar that temple has been demolished akbar had accepted that and it was on his order chabutra was made and rajdeep you are aware and you must have seen that chabutra just in the veranda of babri masjid so that's about the correction of his knowledge and i can go I on to telling you no, 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 let, right uh, let's come let's come to the question i raised the projection of mr modi as a hindu king how does that and fit in with Sangur, the 1950 constitution na modi is not a, modi is not a hindu king modi is elected mp and then member of the parliament elected him as prime minister exactly the way jawaharlal nehru was elected exactly the way manmohan singh was elected exactly the way mrs gandhi and rajiv gandhi were elected tell that they were appointed then modi we can discuss that is modi not an elected mp mm -hmm. has modi not been elected by the parliament mps majority of them and sanghol sanghol is not a hindu uh, symbolism sanghol is symbolism of the power that is the political power you must have seen this rajdand when prince charles was conscripted in one hand cross other hand rajdand rajdand is symbolism of the law truth not the theocracy i mean let us not be so much paranoid with the things that are symbolism in hindu culture so can i can, can i not be so much okay paranoid. so so can i therefore take my original question a little forward with you professor kapila which is uh, my original question was whose vision appears more relevant prime minister modi or former prime minister jawala nehru my second question linked to that is do we need therefore a redefinition of secular values what nehruvian secularism stood versus what secularism is seen as today there are there's a sense that nehruvian secularism was distorted over the years was corroded over the years by vote bank politics and what we are therefore seeing is a reaction to that and that reaction in a way may be, more be in reality or in sync with the situation on the ground secularism in the indian context was never meant to be a complete could never be a separation of church and state of religion and state because of the nature of indian politics and the bjp therefore is unapologetic when the prime minister for example today wears his hindutva on his sleeve 
Yeah, thank you. I, you've got asked many questions. Let me just quickly say that I don't see this as an evolution at all. What we have seen really is 30 years of aggressive militant mobilization on the question of the Ram Temple. And the question of the Ram Temple is entirely related to the chronology of the rise of the BJP as a political electoral force in the country. So whatever map you might want to give it of 500 years or even longer, even of a millennium, it is actually a very precise short history of 35 years. Secondly, you have this big distinction and in perspective, whereas Professor Makanlal and Rajat Sethi want to see the Mughals and Muslim rule as the antagonist, if you look at Jawaharlal Nehru's discovery of India, and if you look at, say, Savarkar's, you know, six glorious epochs of 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 Please Indian don't history. put the words in our mouth. Please don't word. No, let me let me, let me finish. You will see critical distinction. You will see it. Okay, well, Talk Professor in a, Professor Makhanlal, I will language okay. that I always do. Uh, Professor Makhanlal, I will give you time to respond. So, Professor so, Kapila so, so the question really is that actually, for those who are interested in the rise of the BJP and interested in the question of the consequences of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya, for them, the main antagonist seems to be the Mughal, Mughal rule, as therefore the sp span of history becomes 500 years or even a millennium, in which, as it were, the Muslim rule is collapsed into the British rule. And actually, for modern Indian nationalism, for the rise of modern nation states worldwide, not just in India, you the, the greatest antagonist is the British Empire. On this, I just want to make something very clear to your audience that actually the, the British Empire is the exceptional empire in India because it owed its loyalty to another people and another place. Unlike all other empires, whether they were Mughal, slave dynastic, Cholas, Ashoka, what have you. And that is what really even Nehru's book singles out the British precisely for this reason in terms of imperial history. For them, the British are the greatest antagonist in, 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 in India's history. Now, that is all papered over in the recent stuff. You go from, as it were, the Mughal rule, and then you move to the 80s movement, and there you have a long period of decolonization story told. So it is not an evolution. It is an aggressive, militant mobilization, which we all witnessed in the last 30 years. You don't see it. You don't see it as a reaction to the distortions that crept into the so-called secular yes, I mean, secularism. Okay, now I come to the secularism point. I actually think India had a lot to be proud of precisely because India's birth is made on the anvil or on the grounds of a Muslim majority state on its on its frontiers. Right. So you and, and in a way, it's a really bold move to say, well, you know, this is a country which is going to be different from European nation states. It is not going to have a uniform language or a uniform religion as the basis of modern nationality. Now, this is a really bold move, which actually places India in a grand civilizational, but also in a kind of global, as it were, leadership. Let's not forget that Nehru and people like Gandhi were global leaders. They were not simply leaders of India, but they became became leaders of anti-colonial nationalism. India is the first country to go free from the British Empire since the Americans. I think all that story is papered over because we want to see the Muslim story as the antagonistic story in communal terms. Mm -hmm. Indian secularism, of course, had a very rough ride, and you can date it very easily with the Shahbano controversy, which is a turning point. And you see the reversal of political fortunes of, as it were, the Congress, and then the rise of the BJP. Now, we have come a long way from Advani's Rath Yatra to now, as it were, a Hindu first polity. We have seen in, in, the, in the last four or five years, certain legal mechanisms which are coming to, uh, you know, whether it is the abrogation of, uh, you know, 370, certain, whatever the, you know, I'm not sort of getting into those debates, but the point is that the political settlement of India of 1950 is coming on, is being re revised, is being contested, and it is not simply a kind of, you know, seamless, calm evolution. You know, uh, that would be, that, that's actually just, you know, I mean, I just think that's sheer yeah, and on secularism, on secularism, I think the difficulty that lies today is that all extremist ideologies, whether it is in, in the West or India, you know, you know, incite passions. 
Pluralism, nonviolence, as Gandhi also showed, is actually quite a passive set of emotions and is not able to excite people in the way, you know, a Hindu first polity or the national pride. You know, why can't Indians have national pride on, on pluralism? This is the question I would like to ask Professor Makanlal that, you know, what, 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 you know, given that Hinduism itself is internally diverse and, and you know, you mentioned the great, you know, um, um, you know, Manu Smritis and, you know, you mentioned all these, you know, great rituals from India's Vedic and uh, classical Hindu past. But, you know, do we really want to go back there? This is also, these are also, you know, uh, texts which enshrine caste, uh, caste discrimination, you, which also enshrine Shruti, hierarchy. Uh, let, and this let's, is what the let's, let's for a moment, is. let's for a moment stick to what you said on secularism, because I think that is a contested issue. And I think, Rajat Sethi, you need to respond to that. When you say evolution, you seem to suggest it's almost seamless. What is being suggested by Shruti Kapila and Aditya Mukherjee, this is not seamless. This is a complete reversal of what the 1950 project was all about. It's actually majoritarianism versus the pluralism ideal. Your response. And we can use the word pluralism it instead was... of secularism. Many believe that in a way actually defines India, unity, unity in diversity, more as a plural society. Absolutely. Well, I have heard too much of verbose and I really can't make sense of half of what was said prior to what when I started. But let me again reiterate why it is it has been a longer struggle and we shouldn't see it from a three decade myopic view. Uh, you know, uh, there have been previous speakers who've been uh, speaking so eloquently about the Mughals as if Mughals have been intertwined into India's being uh, or Bharat's being. Uh, before, I mean, look at Aurangzeb. I mean, where do where does one even start off with? Even uh, Truske, Professor Truske, who's been uh, sort of uh, uh, one of the biggest supporters of Aurangzeb, also in her book said that he was a wild oppressor of the Hindus. Uh, you know, he forcibly converted Hindus and he unleashed some of the worst kind of oppression systematically on on everything that stood for Hinduism and for Bharatiya culture. And why I should think, why uh, should India of 2024 be defined by Aurangzeb though? The India of 2024, if we are no, this no, mature, self-confident country, you know, if, India, we had, if we had a project cannot, in 1950, which was to give Rajdeep, equality wonder, of citizenship, did how Kapila? do you listen? Did you, did you, you go ahead. Did you interfere Kapila when she... Did you, you go ahead now. No, Rajdeep, did you no, because, you, because you brought the Aurangzeb point. Either you will speak or I will speak. Go but ahead. this cannot carry on. Uh, go ahead. You have to give me a time window. I will give you equal time. You did not intervene Kapila or Professor Aditya Mukherjee even once. When they were talking, which was absolutely untrue and falsehood. Okay, I will, give you, he, I will give you equal Mukherjee time, Rajat Sethi. Temple, which was factually incorrect. No, Rajdeep, you are not. Accept your mistake for once. I will give you equal time. Go ahead. Going back, go. understand that, that Mughal and the Mughal rule unleashed over the Hindus has been part and parcel of our history and a not so uh, sort of good history. If you see India... Uh, from a nation state concept from 1947, you will miss out how India's culture, India's practices have all been intertwined and you can't pull out these threads individually and start running with a narrative. This is what the previous speakers have been doing. My bigger problem right now is when you start looking at a three decade problem and you say, oh, Ram Temple was not an issue at all. Mm -hmm. It was only a three, it was a political project took over a period of three decades and that's what unleashed and uh, it created this tsunami of emotions around the, the entire nation. No, sir, it doesn't work like that. There has been a consistent attack on the being, on the cultural being of our nation over and over and over again. And these external rulers who subjugated us, it was not something, a, a Ganga Yamuna uh, meeting somewhere uh, in the middle of the road. Nothing like that ever happened. And it was done right from Babur to Akbar to Aurangzeb. Everybody had a stab at our civilization right at the heart, piercing through everything that we stood for. And it is taking us time. It took us all these decades to revive, to, to go back to our roots, find confidence in ourselves and, and rise up and, and, and try and define what the future for our nation is not from the Western blinkers, but through our own individual and authentic selves. Mm -hmm. This is where we stand for. And I don't go by sermonizing what professors believe in. It is the common masses of what people think about our nation. And you would want to remove uh, uh, the dharmic aspect of this uh, the nation. Do it. Keep doing it through your university lectures. Do, do people even care about it? The answer is clear, no. And this is where I'm coming from. When you are an academician, the first thing that you have to do is to unpack 
where masses, crores and crores of people are thinking. Why are they thinking? What are they thinking? What are the deep things that they value? What they hold dear to themselves? It is not a, a, a Western nation state phenomena here. It is not a church or a state. The church is trying to control uh, what the state's responsibility is. We've never had that history. We have never been a monolith. That is also true. We've been, we've been all kinds of people who've come in and amalgamated together, but it has never been the case like Aurangzeb or, or the Mughals who've come in and, uh, and, and literally destroyed a civilization. Where in North India do you ever come across temples which date at least a thousand years old? They've all been ravaged, demolished, finished off. Go to you're saying, you you're saying, temple in Delhi. You're saying this is a civilizational project. Don't see it as a political project. Where do you stand on the secularism versus pluralism BJP question? Where do you go. stand on Nobody the where, where do you stand? No, no, it but Rajat, where do you stand on the pluralism versus secularism debate? The point being made is that Nehruvian secularism actually stood for pluralism. May have been distorted by political parties with vote bank politics, but that was the ideal. Today, according to critics well, of uh, of the BJP, what is we are throwing the baby out with the bathwater and turning towards majoritarianism. Well, Nehru, when he see Nehru was a uh, was an individual who who was born and bred up and like in in a complete different setting. You cannot match uh, a leader of those times when he had to come up with uh, with sort of a. A management tool to to hold the hold the nation together, and it has been uh, divided on religious lines. Per se, he was the one who devised the Nehru Liaquat Pact. He said that the Hindus need to find a homeland, and this is the only country where the Hindus should come into should should be able to come into and call themselves as home. You know, we talk today about CAA, but the the actual uh, the genesis of the entire CAA was Nehru Liaquat Pact. But nobody wants to talk about it. In 1951, Nehru said. It is. Uh, it is one of the first laws that he brought in the in the parliament. Then was uh, was actually about bringing in the Hindus and the Hindus alone into India. If you go further deeper, uh, uh, Nehru was the one who who ensured that uh, when the civilized when the population exchange is happening between the two countries, Hindus find it safe to come in and settle. Okay, can I? So see, he had certain certain objectives in mind. Which were there when a nation was. He did not into want two. India to become and a Hindu Pakistan. He did not want India to become a Hindu Pakistan. Sir, you, you are stretching it too far. Nobody wants to make any nation Pakistan. No other country would want to become a Pakistan. I am talking okay? of 1947. So a nation on our border. Pakistan is, is, when partition takes place, we have on the border a state which is founded on the base of religion. Nehru, Ambedkar, Gandhi, others of that period didn't want that. They didn't want India to succumb to these forces. Why will you accept that? Yes or no? Absolutely. Why? Why do you think, Rajdeep? And I've seen your previous shows as well. Why are you hellbent in saying that this is a Hindu Rashtra? It is not. Neither is it a Hindu state or a theocratic state. Do you understand what a theocracy looks like? If not, go to Saudi Arabia. You will see what a theocracy looks like. Do you see any tenets of theocracy in our country? Okay, then let I Aditya. Really let Ad, since since Aditya, no, 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 Aditya Mukherjee, just a minute, sir. In the Middle East, not in India. Okay, Aditya Mukherjee, you use that word theocracy first. You've got here Rajat Sethi saying, please do not throw these words at us. If you want to see a theocratic state, go to Saudi Arabia, India. This is civilizational. And as Professor uh, uh, Makhanlal said, Vasudeva Kutumbakam is the basis of India's legacy in a way where, according to them. You are fear mongering once again by throwing words like Hindu Rashtra or calling it a pro political project when it's actually a civilizational project. And it leads to me to my third question. India versus Bharat. Is new India discovering a more rooted Indian identity? Is the question I want to pose. Respond to that, Professor Mukherjee. As when, when I heard Ratatji, I could almost see that how we are moving, what direction we are moving in. The way in which he described the entire Mughal period, you know, as uh, and that is why, as you know, the, the Mughal period has been removed from our history textbooks, etc., as one of continuous atrocities. You know, it's an imagination, it's a memory being created which did not exist. Do remember that the, the 1857, the first war of independence, which everybody is talking about, <laughs> who did the the Hindu uh, Brahmin soldiers, etc., included? Who did they go to? To and, and say uh, that that we want we, we want to throw out the British. They went to Bahadur Shah Zafar, <laughs> the Mughal Emperor. You know there wasn't. This is a new feeling. This is a historical memory being created of this 
this Muslim atrocities for thousands of years. This is what uh, it was said with, about the Somnath, that, you know, that the destruction of the Somnath for a thousand years seared the psyche of the Hindus. Nothing of the kind happened. 250 years after the destruction of the Somnath, the, the temple authorities there gave a Muslim trader the, the right to build a mosque in the temple, in the temple uh, properties. <laughs> you know, this memory of Somnath destruction by Muhammad of Ghazni is an invention again in the 19th century. The first time it is mentioned is in the so British you Parliament. Believe, you the believe that the Ganga Jamni Tezib... No, no, one minute. Professor Mukherjee, you seem to believe that the Ganga Jamni Tezib is real? It exists? <laughs> Am I correct? That because is India. That is India. You're, you're, and what they're, what they're, yes, that is what is India. And what, what they're doing is dis, trying to destroy that by, and create a complete a vision which does, is not our civilizational okay. uh, practice. I, I will give Rajat a quick intervention and then go to Professor Makhanla. You, you know, you, uh, you're saying the Ganga, the Jamni Tezib is the essence of India. You want to respond again uh, to, to that, Rajat? And you, then I'll go okay. To so, to, so Professor Mukherjee is the, I think he's the Dean of uh, the Center for Historical Studies and Contemporary India. And I really, I, I wonder uh, what would the students be learning from him if he's the one who's teaching him. Sorry, I don't want to make a no, personal let's remark. Let's not make sir, personal but remarks. Like Please, no personal remarks. You've conveniently, do you think that Ganga Jamuni Tehjeeb is when you come in and plunder our temples, take away the loot from our nation? Is that Ganga Jamuni Tehjeeb? So please, you can keep that Tehji with you. We don't, we don't believe in that Tehji. Do I need to quote historians here and Indologists here who have come in and studied the Mughal rule in detail? Let me quote but, Nicholas Gere. Should I? He no, but, clearly said, okay, so you, and I'll, I'll quote him. Nicholas Gere, let me quote him. He said, the, atro the, the, the minor insults of Islam on the Islam or disrespect for Islamic size pale in comparison to the great destructions of temples and general persecution of Hindus by the Mughals for 500 years. These are not Indian accounts or BJP's accounts. And I'm just I, quoting one can historian. I, can I for a I moment, can, on and on can, and I, on. can I for a moment, since I use the word Ganga Jamni Tezi, Professor Mukherjee, you want to quickly define what Ganga Jamni Tezi means and then I'll bring Professor Makhanlal. Yeah. I, I want to make two points. One is that in the pre-modern times, across religions, there were destructions of temples. There were many Hindus who destroyed large number of Buddhist temples. One sect of Hindus destroyed another sect of the temples and mosques, etc. This kind of thing is a very different thing from what we are talking about. You know, let us not mix that up. And certainly, as I said, the civilizational value of our country, the reason why the, this, this country survives is our ability to see change, to, to absorb it, to assimilate, to learn, as, as Nehru says, like a palimpsest, you know, and without erasing anybody else. You know, that is what it has, it has been. And Ganga Jamini Tahzeeb is precisely that. It, it is the evolution of give a very high culture. Give me an example. Know, in give which me an example which has which for you. Give me an example, Professor, that defines it today, contemporary uh, India. Uh, uh, I'll, I, I'll give you, I can give you several examples. T take, take the uh, Wajid Ali Shah. T take the Hindustan, the, one of the, you know, there are two courses on musicology taught on his contribution to Indian music, you know, and to Indian dance, to Bharatna, to uh, Kathak, you know. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that if you, if you look at our music, take, take uh, 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 this, uh, uh, you know, the Chap Tilak, just in the Kayar, Amir Khusro, you know, his songs written are sung till today, 600, 700 years later, across people, across the yeah, Ganga Jamni region in Bangladesh, in India, and in Pakistan. And do you Pakistan. understand what Chap Tilak, huh? Moses Chin, uh, Lady? Do you understand the literal meaning of that? Mose, Ha, ha, it is of about course. typing out the, uh, the Burman. There are many interpretations. You will, you, will, you will have the, your understanding. Uh, and, and that is why you think all the Hindus and Muslims and no, everybody is saying it. Was that is your interpretation. Was Nizam's rule. <laughs> this, is not, this, is not, this is not the, not the whole world. Was Nizam's rule a Ganga Jemini Tehjeeb? Okay, I ask you, Professor. 
Can I for a... No, no, Rajdeep, don't deflect. He has no answers. This fake concept creation was a three-decade project. I'll give we you all an answer. understand from the 50s, 60s, and the 70s historians I, I'll give were you an created literally around these these things. Okay, of let him respond. Rajat, you asked a question. No you asked a question. Let him respond. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Mukherjee. I I'll just say that if you want, what is your project? What does a historian do? If you want to. It, it's the reason why all history is called, called contemporary history is that what is it that you're going to pick up from history to explain your contemporary, your present, and to look at the future. If you want to create hatred, and if you want to create a certain kind of society, you will pick. See, I mean, it is not that there hatred, has been sir. no atrocity in I'm the past. Of course, the there has been. It if you, no, no, if no, you, no, Rajat, let me finish. Let me finish. It, let me finish. Let me finish. No, no, if, Rajat, let, let me finish. Let, let Rajat, me finish. Let me finish. Let, let yeah, me finish. Go. Let me finish. Hmm? But on the other hand, if you want to create a society which, which is uh, multicultural, which is, uh, uh, which is humane, then you will draw from your own history. And there is enough to draw from, right from the Greek Veda onwards, through the Upanishads, through Buddhism, where the notion of multiple truths is there. I mean, that is what India is famous for. The, the, uh, the acceptance of multiple truths, the alternate routes to, to, to truth, etc. Now, that is what we will draw for. We will draw from, as I said, from the, the Upanishads, from the Rig Ved. We will draw from Buddha. We will draw from Akbar. We will draw, draw right through. And that, that, that is the tradition we want to pursue. Okay, Rather than look for every little murder that, that has taken tradition. place. Sir, can, and I say, can I get, get Professor Makhanlal? Rajat, I must allow Professor Makhanlal has been listening quietly. No, just a minute. Professor Makhanlal, you know, what is being suggested by uh, Professor Mukherjee, the Indian Republic now, at least politically, is drawing its sustenance by, according to him, looking for symbols of hate, rather than looking for symbols that unite. Even Ram, according to the likes of Professor Mukherjee, he said it on the show, is being weaponized. Jai Shri Ram is being weaponized as a form to intimidate people rather than being seen to build bridges. Your response to that, Professor Makhanlal? Rajdeep ji, first of all, my apologies to you and your viewers. I, it's not my habit to interrupt in middle. When Kapila ji was speaking, I interrupted because she was telling something lie, which I had not spoken, and she said I have spoken, so I had to correct it. And also, let me correct her, I have never, never, you can go back to recording, taken the name of Manu Ismriti. She said I have been talking about, this is correction. But my apology, you know my nature, okay, I don't go ahead. go ahead. First thing is, there are two issues. There are, entire questions are connected to two single words. And you will agree, one is pluralism, other is secularism. All the discussion can be just grouped into here. And that is where I want to talk about it. Secularism is something we all know. It is separation of state from the religion. And why it came... We do have to go back some other time to European history and how the word secularism in English language came up. Not, this is not a cultural word of India. Other word is pluralism. Plural society is the identity of this country. Right from Rig Vedic time where Vedas have mentioned several kind of people and it is the pluralist ethos of this nation, this country, this people that Buddhism comes up. Jainism comes up, Sikhism comes up. Charvak is here as one of the most respected Rishi. What do you else we want? Hundreds of sects are there. It's not uniform society. It's very, very diverse society. Let us not rumor monger and destroy the mental peace of the people. Country has never, never been a, a theocratic state. Never. Right from the Rig Vedic time till time of Cholas or even in, you can take uh, 17th, 18th century, tell me one state, tell Professor Kapila and let uh, Adit Mukherjee tell her, one state which was theocratic state where, like in Europe, popes were the final in the ruling of the country. No. Always this was. Always, always political power Correct. was kept from religious issue. India is a dharma prana state. India is a religious 
people, but not religious state. We ought to be separate. That religious, being a religious man is not bad. If anybody says that I am a proud Hindi, so I am a bad. So my friends, some of them are best Muslims I know. Are they also bad? Being religious is not bad. A state in India has never been religious, and we must learn to this. And let me tell Aditya Mukherjee ji, you said that Mughal period of history has been wiped away from the courses. Are you still sitting at home doing nothing? Come out of the home and just check it. What is being taught and what is not being taught? Why say this kind of thing, yar? We we know each other so well. Okay, and can I? Let can me I just end this? Yes. One very simple. One, just one. No, just yes. a minute. I yeah. have not finished. Yes, go ahead. Weaponized. That was the word used, and this is a very dangerous word. Has Aditya Mukherjee and Kapila have they read Ramayana and Mahabharata? Yes. Did they not have the weapon in their hand right from their childhood? Did they not kill the evils with their own weapon? Yes. Did uh, not Krishna guided the entire world with his own weapon and also others? Yes. And have not the Lord Ram and Krishna picked up the weapon to destroy the evil? Why you are misinterpreting and taking the thing to completely? Unwanted side, please, please, I beg you. Having spent okay. 46 years in the university as teacher, let me say that please let us talk sense and let us talk which makes sense to the can people I, also. Can I? Can I therefore, can since I, can I therefore then, since this is Republic Day and as we wind down, I want to ask each of you, and I am going to give each of you 30 to 40 seconds on this. What does it mean, therefore, to you to be Indian today, in 2024? 75 as we enter the 75th year of indian independence you start professor kapila what according to you is your belief of being indian there i say idea of india i definitely very proud uh, to come from a legacy that as it were undid the british for sure uh, it is it is the first country to be uh, to be decolonized i actually wanted to say something else so uh, what's which... the best thing of being indian i've got limited time what's the best no, thing of the kapila being indian no i mean precisely that indian? history of, 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 of political leadership in the world to create a nationality out of diversity out of anti colonialism out of a social justice program and that really is a matter of pride and i do think this question that you have raised on bharat and india civilization and uh, is important and we, and i only wanted to say that what the future looks like because all history is about future writing it is striking to me that the increasingly the comparisons are going comparisons are going to be with china which we have not talked about there are only two leaders today who have used the word new era and civilizational state one is prime minister modi and the other is xi jinping i leave it there and i think this is where the story is and i think we will see as it were a greater contestation with the west in which india and china will be rivals and i think that is a story that is also unfolding in which actually this hindu first polity is also finding a hospitable uh, world view both internationally and nationally okay. i don't want to speak about yeah let, let, and i let, think i had I, i your time is up i i have to put the clock on everyone rajat sethi what's the best thing about being indian 40 seconds i'm proud to belong to a dharmic nation called bharat whose uh, civilizational values cuts across uh, differences between individuals its, its values are all encompassing it it its values span around uh, you know call uh, itself as a vasudev kutumbakam treating everybody around the world as one family i'm proud that the civilization has stood the test of time for thousands and thousands of years and by the grace of uh, bhagwan ram it will carry on for several millennia even in the future okay. the word dharmic nation in itself can lead to some element of contestation because you know how is dharma Let being used be. Well, how is dharma actually being used by the political understand power dharma, is it... understand dharma yeah. dharma and religion will be separate will always be different okay let professor uh, uh, mukherjee have a word what is the best thing professor mukherjee about being indian what you believe is the ideal sense of being indian i i think the manner in which we imagined our nation as opposed as shruti correctly said as opposed to how nations were imagined in europe 
one language, one religion, Catholic France, for example, etc. India Im imagined itself as one way it will celebrate diversity. D diversity of languages, diversity of religion, diversity in every sphere. So that I'm proud to be that. Secondly, I'm proud of the fact that India, among probably among the, the very few post-colonial countries which was able to establish a democratic system. And that, unfortunately, is under threat. And democracy can be the route to authoritarianism, as we are seeing the world over. So don't tell me that Modi was democratically elected. So was Hitler. So was Erdogan. So was Bolsonaro. So we must be vigilant that this vision of India, of it being multicultural, of it being inclusive, of it being democratic, should not be allowed to okay. go. And I want yeah. to say that, as uh, Makan Lalji correctly said, said, that we didn't have in the past any, any theocratic state. Hmm? If he, he better, uh, 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 between Rajatji and Makan Lalji, there is a contradiction, hmm? because Rajatji believes that they were, there were these Muslim states <laughs> annihilating everybody else, but whereas uh, Makan Lalji believes that we never had theocratic state. I'm, okay, I agree let, with him. I, I, your we time is have, up, sir. Let us not sir, have sir, it sir, in with the due future. regard, uh, uh, Professor Makan Lal, a final word. The best thing about being Indian. Best thing about being Indian is we have always believed in people's liberty, equality, and Rig Ved said, very simple. If your neighbor is hungry, how can you sleep in your home? That's the principle. And therefore, Sarva Dharma Sambhav, Ekam Satvi Prabhudhavadam, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, should be, we should be proud of, we should be identified with these principles, meaning thereby, pluralism is something we have practiced throughout. Mm -hmm. It is, will never be under threat. It will never go out of this land we will be able to teach others how to respect pluralism, how to maintain pluralism and pluralism of language, pluralism of culture, pluralism of food habit, pluralism, all the things is plural that has survived in India for the last 9,000 years. It will survive for another millennia or two or ten till Sanatan Dharma and Hinduism survives. Okay. And that is what I am proud of and nation should be proud of. Let me leave it there. As I said, this is the history debate, this Republic Day weekend, where uh, we've contested different visions of history. And if we can carry on that and allow different views to be expressed in a spirit of dialogue, rather than see this as polarization and make it them versus us, then maybe the pluralism that was just spoken about will eventually triumph in this country. This is the most unique, diverse country in the world made long remain that way treasure it because that is what is the strength of the indian republic thank you all very much for joining me here on this republic day round table thanks for watching stay well stay safe jai hind namaskar